God's word. Jesus, you are majestic and glorious. And there's not a word that I can say and there's not an action that I can perform that can make you any more glorious or any more majestic. But I do ask one request this morning, is that every eye in this place would be open, Lord, that we would see more of your glory and that we would see more of your majesty this morning. Open our hearts, we ask, and open our eyes in your wonderful and glorious name. Amen. Amen. Okay, if you'd like to meet me in Mark chapter 10, uh, and we'll begin at verse 46. It's a reasonably long chapter. <clears throat> we'll begin in verse 46. I want to talk to you this morning about the man who stopped Jesus. Uh, over the next couple of weeks, um, I, I want to look at some of the miracles from the gospel, some of the healings in the gospels, and just uh, this is one of the first ones I want to have a look at today. This is a, a fantastic account of a man that was uh, healed. But uh, does anybody here? Sounds like a silly question, but does anybody here remember John Howard and, and Peter Costello? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm actually deep, deeply thankful for their government. I think that uh, while they were in government, some ups and downs, sure, but Australia was in great shape when we had John Howard and, and Peter Costello, and I pray that God will take us into great shape under Scott Morrison and the Liberal government. But all of that aside, I can remember a scene, one, most people here probably wouldn't even remember, but there was, a, there was a young girl who had contracted skin cancer, melanoma, from spending a, a huge amount of time in solariums. And uh, it then became uh, something that was very vocal in Australia about the health risks of, of exposing yourself to solariums. And, and this young lady, uh, tragically cut down uh, before she was even 30, uh, she was one of the spokesmen for uh, the, the dangers of solariums. And John Howard got right behind her and uh, John Howard was closely linked with what was going on. And I remember one particular scene when she passed away, uh, John Howard comes out, there's a, there, at the same time there's an immense amount going on legislation-wise in Parliament. And uh, the picture was John Howard walking down the corridor with like six of his cabinet members around him and they're all talking to him and there's cameras flashing and there's news reporters everywhere and John Howard's got voices everywhere and then one person just steps out and says I just want to let you know that such and such passed away and immediately John Howard stopped he ignored everybody else that was there and he looked this person in the eyes and he said I'm deeply saddened at this news and he said can you please pass on my condolences and he addressed this one voice he addressed this one person and today we're going to have a look at a man that raised his voice and he stopped Jesus just like John Howard stopped We'll have a look at the account of his healing. Before we go any further, I'd like to make it clear <clears throat> that when we come both to the accounts in the Gospels as well as the accounts in the book of Acts, they are a description of what happens. They are not a prescription for what happens. Let me explain what I mean by that. There is sometimes, there is the danger that we attempt to, to kind of put a formula around God. We, we, we might look at the, the accounts of healings and miracles inside of the Gospels and we might try to make a one, two, three step for how we get healing. Can I tell you, there are no three steps to anything in God. And I'll tell you why. There's not a formula, there's not a program, there's not a guru on this planet that can frame God into any kind of formula. You can't remove the mystery from God. You can't put him into a box. There's no 10-step programs for anything. They are a description of what happens when people meet Christ. When we look in the book of Acts and we see that there are eight times in particular, for example, in the book of Acts where people are filled with the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you something. Every time it happens, it's different. And let me tell you that every person that is healed or is miraculously encounters Christ in the Gospels, it's different. Why? Because every individual is different. But in saying that there's no formulas, we learn and we are encouraged and we are inspired by what happens. It is designed to raise expectation in our hearts. You can't put a formula around God and that's actually the best news you'll hear today. Why? Because God will break out of any formula. 
So does God miraculously heal people today? Yes. Does God miraculously set people free today? Yes. Are you one of the people that God just might touch today? Yes. And that's the whole point of what we read in the Gospels. It points to who Jesus is. We're going to have a look at the faith of one man today. And why they, Jesus will say to one man today, your faith has made you well. What was it about his faith? We're going to have a look at that. And the man we're going to look at is a guy by the name of Bartimaeus. If you've met me in Mark chapter 10, we begin in verse 46 and it says, And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd. And Jesus, uh, let's, let's, put this, let's put some framework around what's happening here. Uh, Jesus uh, has come to Jericho. He's now going to take the short journey from Jericho to Jerusalem and begin his Passion Week. The very next event on the calendar is Palm Sunday. Jesus has set his face, says the Gospel of Luke, like Flint to go to Jerusalem. Why? His hour has come and he's going to meet it. Nothing will stop him getting to Jerusalem. And he finds himself in Jericho. And, and as we're reading through the Gospel of Mark, it's important that we know one thing. It is written by a guy by the name of John Mark. John Mark was not a disciple of Jesus, but he writes very strong evidence that he writes the words of Peter the Apostle. And Peter the Apostle. Why? Peter couldn't write. When you read the first epistle of Peter, uh, this letter I sent to you at the hand of Silvanus. Why? Peter couldn't write. He wasn't educated. He was a fisherman, which means he was holy. All fishermen are holy. <laughs> We're getting there. <laughs> Reuben doesn't catch fish, so he doesn't apply. You can't turn me down today, champ. <laughs> so, so here we find Jesus in Jericho heading off to Jerusalem. And as we read on, it says that Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And this is actually very important because you will find in Matthew chapter 20, as well as towards the end of the Gospel of Luke, that there are accounts of blind men healed when Jesus gets to Jericho. In fact, Luke says there was two. Is there a conf conflict here? No, there was definitely one, but there may have been more. But Mark wants to focus on one guy, and Mark does something that the other writers do not do, and Peter makes it clear as he's orating this, if you want to talk to this guy, go and find him. Why? Because it's Bartimaeus from Jericho, whose father is Timaeus. There's no hiding who this is. This is no guesswork. Go and find him for yourself. Mark is not naming Bartimaeus by accident. Nothing in the Bible is an accident, by the way. No word is an accident in the Bible. And Bartimaeus is named deliberately. Mark makes it clear. But Bartimaeus is a blind beggar. You probably couldn't have got any lower than to be a blind beggar in this day. You made your, you made your money by positioning yourself correctly. It's, all, it's like real estate. It's all about location. You, you always sought the prominent place near the temple or anywhere like that where people might be more willing to give you something. And Bartimaeus has cut a living, it would appear, from being a beggar. He would most likely, most invalids and blind people in the first century were placed there by family members so that they could beg. Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside, just like he would have done any other day. And just like he has done for many days previous. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out. You see, the feet are starting to rustle. A crowd is starting to form. Voices are starting to lift. And Bartimaeus must be getting inquisitive. What's going on here? And somebody said, Jesus of Nazareth is coming. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he begins to cry out. We're at the end of Jesus' ministry. This guy has heard about a man from Nazareth. He's heard about a man that can open blind eyes. He's heard about a man that can raise the dead. Why? Because when we get to the Gospel of John, Christ Crowds have formed and followed Christ because everyone's heard about Lazarus. Everyone's heard Jesus didn't hide Lazarus. <laughs> 
He made sure there was a crowd there for Lazarus. And the Pharisees are gnashing their teeth because his popularity it has exploded. They even want to kill Lazarus, we find out in the Gospel of John. Because everything that the Pharisees hold dear is under threat. You see, when you've got religious systems like the Pharisees had, when you had uh, rules and regulations and laws and formulas, everything's under threat because there's a man coming that will shatter your formulas. I have personally experienced, and I need everybody in this room to know, because Bartimaeus is about to find this out, there is never a coincidence in God. There is always opportunity. We look at it as coincidence. Well, it just so happened, or it could have been one of the most amazing opportunities. God opens doors. I wonder, as we move our way through this picture, um, what does start to kind of play on me a little bit is, we've read about the crowds. Jesus is walking along the most popular roadside in that time. It doesn't take much to work out that Bartimaeus wouldn't have been the only blind guy there that day. Bartimaeus wouldn't have been the only invalid. Bartimaeus wouldn't have been the only guy that needed something. In fact, I bet you every one of the people following Jesus in the crowd had some kind of need. But one man will encounter Christ. One man. When he heard... He began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. This, we'll, we'll unpack this prayer a little bit more in a moment. But I want to highlight what, what Bartimaeus didn't say, just as we're going forward here. Bartimaeus didn't sing out and say, Oi, I'm a Jew, I'm in covenant with God, you owe me. That's, that's not what Bartimaeus said. And I also find it amazing that Bartimaeus didn't say, Jesus, son of Joseph. And he didn't say Jesus, son of Mary. He said Jesus, son of David. David's been dead for hundreds of years. What are you talking about? It's a direct link to the messianic prophecies of the one that would come. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus is beginning his ministry. And amazing miracles are happening at the hands of Jesus. His fame is beginning to spread. And he goes to his hometown. And we all know what happens when we get there, don't we? No miracles happen in his hometown. Nothing happens at all. Why? Because if you listen to the voice of those that were there, they all said, is this not Joseph's son? Is this not the carpenter's son? No. And what we see here, first and foremost, is Bartimaeus has had a revelation of who Jesus is. Jesus, you're not the son of Joseph. Jesus, you're not the son of Mary. Jesus, you are the one the prophets have written about. You are the one that I will place my hope in. You are the one I will cry out to. Why? Because you're the one that was to come. You are the son of David. And while Jesus remains the son of Joseph, he can do nothing in our hearts and in our lives. When Jesus is nothing more than a man, when Jesus is nothing more than a good teacher and a good story, and he had some good morals that we should follow, he can't have an impact on your heart. But when he's the son of David, all things are possible. The Jesus prayer is this. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. That word mercy is twofold. It acknowledges the need of the one asking, but it also acknowledges the adequacy of the resources of the one being asked. And the moment that Bartimaeus is crying out, have mercy upon me, he is exposing that he has a need. And in the same word, he is crying out to the one who can meet his need. C.H. Spurgeon puts it beautifully. C.H. Spurgeon says, I have a great need of a saviour. But then he turns around and says, I have a great saviour for my need. That would be what Bartimaeus would say here. I have a great need and I have a great saviour. For my need. He is, he is not telling God what to do. He is not commanding God. He's not framing God. He's pleading with God and asking, Have mercy on me. 
Sounds like a desperate plea. I have not looked at all of the historical accounts of revivals and awakenings that have broken out, but I have found a commonality in every single one of them that I have looked at, and that is this. Every single one of them began with a thirst and a desperation in the heart of God's people that was not quenched until God came in power. We are missing the desperation that Bartimaeus is crying out with here. This pastor is missing that desperation. We all need that kind of desperation. It's the desperation that says, if you don't meet my need, Jesus, nobody else is going to. I can't do it myself. But have a look at what Christ can do to somebody in that place. Jesus, son of David, says Bartimaeus, have mercy on me, and many rebuked him. Happens today sometimes as well. Sometimes the many rebuke the few, the cry out. Many rebuked him. Why? They're trying to maybe keep him silent, keep face. Uh, you, Jesus isn't going to stop for you. And uh, look at the crowds here. And they rebuke him. Many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But I love the response of Bartimaeus. Are you picking up on some, some faith notes here? One of them is, he cried out all the more. And that word cry there, both times it's used in this passage, cry and cried, is a Greek word called krazo. The next time you will see the word krazo is when Christ is upon the cross crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the word used when they say, and he cried out. And when Christ cried out from the cross, he cried out in anguish. When Christ cried out from the cross, he cried out from inside, deep, deep inside. And it's the same cry that we hear at the lips of Bartimaeus. Doesn't matter what they say. And can I tell you, friends, today, don't let anybody rebuke you. You cry out to God just as loud as you want to. You live your life for Christ as loud as you want to. Have you ever heard the phrase, are oh, they too heavenly minded to be any earthly good? Has anybody ever heard that? It's rubbish. We need more people that are heavenly minded. Don't let anybody tell you that you're too spiritual. You can't be too spiritual. Do what Bartimaeus did and cry out all the more. Dance all the more. I won't bless you with my dancing. <laughs> Many rebuked him and the cry out is a cry of desperation. Something amazing happens. Many rebuked him, telling him to be silent, but he cried out all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped. I find this amazing about Jesus. Jesus came to save the world and he ran nowhere. <laughs> and Jesus came to save the world and he walked everywhere he went. He hardly, the only time we see him on a donkey is in a moment when he, when he grabs a donkey and rides on into Jerusalem. But apart from that, he walked everywhere. And uh, even Zacchaeus, you read the account of Zacchaeus, he, he, he's, he's passing through Jericho and this little weird guy jumps up a tree and he stops and has tea with Zacchaeus. You see, what sometimes we consider to be interruptions, Jesus saw as opportunities. And a man cries out and Jesus stops. You know, faith will stop Jesus every time. We're going to have a look in a moment that the amount of faith is actually not what is important. Why? Jesus was the very one that told us, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed. Does anybody here know how big a mustard seed is? Uh, when, when Jesus said faith as big as a mustard seed, he was highlighting the fact that the amount is not what's important. The amount of your faith in this room this morning is not what's important. Save the eggs and tomatoes until I'm finished. But Jesus stopped. And Jesus stopped because a man cries out from desperation. Jesus says to the crowd, you know, Jesus could have gone to Bartimaeus himself. It's not an accident that Jesus said to the ones that rebuked him and told him to be silent, call him. Have a look at what Bartimaeus does here. And they called the blind man saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. Bartim this is the only possession that Bartimaeus has. And throwing off his cloak, 
No regard for a blind man trying to find his cloak again. It's like Reuben trying to find fish. <laughs> and throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and he came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, everybody loves this line. Preachers live on this line. We, as preachers, we love this. We can preach on this one all day. What do you want me to do for you? I want to ask everybody in this, quest, in this room today this one question. If Jesus was standing here, what would you answer him if he asked you this question? And this is not the first time he's asked it. In fact, just previous to this, he asked the same question of John and James. You see, John and James, full of pride, full of ambition, they're pretty political, these two guys. They're twins, by the way, John and James. That's the writer of the Gospel of John. They come to Jesus and say, we would like you to grant us something. Jesus replies, what do you want me to do for you? <coughs> Who knows that when your kids come and say, Dad, I need something. Who knows that you clarify before you say yes, right? Here's another thing I found. Whenever Jesus asks a question, he's not looking for information. He already knows what James and John wants. He wants James and John to know what they want. So he asked them a question, what do you want me to do for you? And they say, give us the place at your right hand in power and authority. And Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. <laughs> and it begins to highlight, you don't know where you're asking that from. Why? Because their answer to that question came from a place of pride. It came from a place of seeking power and privilege. And can I tell you, the answer for you will be the same as it was for James and John. And you can read that to find out what the answer was. But now Jesus comes to a man that's crying out to him, crying out for mercy. And he says, what do you want me to do for you? He knows. Everybody else knows that Bartimaeus is blind. Jesus knows that Bartimaeus is blind. Jesus wants Bartimaeus to use words and say what he wants. And can I tell you, don't be afraid to say what you want. In fact, be specific. Faith is specific. Doubt is often general. But if Jesus could grant you one request this morning, if Jesus could do one thing for you today, what would that be? I'll let you ponder that. Jesus has an answer for Bartimaeus. What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, or actually in the Greek it's the Rabboni, Rabbi is teacher, Rabboni is my Lord. <laughs> Big difference. When I was in school, none of my teachers were my Lord. None of them were my friends either for very long. And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, he says, go your way. Your faith has made you well. The faith, the word for faith used here is the word pistis, which is a firm persuasion or conviction based upon hearing. Romans 10, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And there is a firm persuasion and conviction that is developed in Bartimaeus about who Jesus is and what Jesus can do for him based on what he's heard. That's why it's important to tell people about Jesus. That's why your testimony is amazingly important. It's telling people what Jesus has done for you. No one can take that away from you. We can argue facts and science until we're blue in the face. But he says, your faith, which is your firm conviction. What kind of faith is this? First of all, note this. That uh, Bartimaeus' faith is displayed in a full grasping of who Jesus is. Number one, we see... A faith that has a firm conviction and persuasion on who Jesus is. There is an amazing danger of sitting in church pews for many, many years and not, still not knowing who Jesus is. Jesus asked his disciples in Matthew chapter 16, who do the crowd say that I am? And then he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter answers, you're the Messiah. And Jesus says, 
based upon the revelation of who I am, based upon this, Peter, upon this rock, the rock of the revelation of who I am, I'll build my church. A supernatural organisation. You are seated inside of a supernatural organisation right now. And it's not based on... It doesn't matter who's standing up here. It doesn't matter what the chairs look like. It doesn't matter who's on morning tea this morning. It doesn't matter who led worship. That's not what matters. What matters is whose body we are. So he has a firm conviction of who Jesus is. Here's another thing we see uh, that is highlighted in the faith of Bartimaeus. It is one that persisted despite hindrances and persecution. Sometimes faith needs to persist. Faith will often be attacked. Faith is not always now. Preach it, Pastor. It's all right, we live in Western society where we have to have our answers today, we have to have our answers now. Faith looks like, Bartimaeus' faith looks like, a faith that persisted no matter the obstacles that came his way. I've got some good news for everybody in this room. Anytime you exercise faith, you're about to have some obstacles come your way. You back that one in. Number three. His faith was a faith faith filled with expectation. He is crying out to one with, with a heart full of expectation that he will receive. If Jesus would only come, If Jesus will only hear me. That's why he began crying out. Here's an opportunity. I'm going to take that opportunity. His faith was full of expectation. I want to use an analogy that Timothy Keller uses when I said that it's not the amount of your faith that matters. Uh, Imagine back to the time of the Israelites leaving Egypt and, and Moses and the Israelites approached the Red Sea. Do you know every one of the Israelites turned around and said, we're going to die now because here comes the Egyptian army. So there's some faith for you. We're all going to die. They're coming after us. Here's a sea. There's the Egyptians. We're dead. Game over. Moses picks up the staff and hits the water like God told him to. Boom, straight through. Who knows that of the at least 600,000 Israelites at that point in time, who knows that there would have been varying amounts of faith as they're walking through? Who knows that, who knows that there would have been some going, oh, yes, God, we believe. Who knows that there would have been others looking at that wall of water going, <laughs> Okay? That was Greek for whoa. You ever been in an aquarium? Imagine an aquarium without the glass. And it says that they all passed through. And I have no doubt that there would have been some serious doubters amongst the Israelite crowd. There would have been some struggling in their faith. And there would have been some bold as brass. Maybe Aaron and Moses are like, no, this is all right, this is cool, walking on through. So what we do see is, <laughs> it's not the amount of your faith that is important, it is the object of your faith. Because every single one of them passed through dry land with their eyes fixed on God. They knew God parted the waters. Now, why did the Egyptians perish in the water? Because they didn't have any concept of it. Every one of the plagues attacks the idols of Egypt. Friends, I want to tell you, don't, anybody, don't let anybody tell you you can't receive because you didn't have enough faith. Don't you let anybody tell you that. Don't you let anybody blame you for that. Because it's not the amount of faith. But what these miracles implore each and every one of us to do is to get our eyes on the one that we should be crying out to. Jesus goes on and says, go your way, your faith has made you well. And that word well there is actually whole. Who knows that Bartimaeus could have received his sight there and then and still been unwhole. Because anything that's whole is something that is no longer damaged and with nothing missing. And who knows that we live in a world full of damaged, broken people. 
This is going to surprise everybody here, I know. But there was an enormous amount of time where, and I still am to a large degree, broken and damaged. Why? Because sin does something to the human heart. As one American preacher put it, if sin was blue, we'd all be Smurfs. You know, Bartimaeus didn't actually need his sight restored. He needed exactly what Jesus had for him, and that was wholeness. And actually, the one thing that Bartimaeus needed is the same thing that we all need as well. We all need our eyes opened. If we saw Christ more clearly, if we saw, I tell you, if, from going on what John says in the book of Revelation, in the first chapter of Revelation, if we saw just a glimpse of the glory that he saw then, we'd be transformed for an eternity. It would absolutely wipe us off the planet. If we had our eyes open just to see a little bit more. And I want to finish this morning as the worship team, if I could ask the worship team to make their way back. We're going to sing a song this morning, but I want to ask everybody in this room this morning, what can Jesus do for you?